All right. Hi, everyone. Today, we are going to talk about enhancing cyber resilience with CIP, the civil infrastructure platform. Um, before we dive in, let me introduce ourselves. I'm Yosuke Kobayashi, CIP Technical Steering Committee Chair, and Dimish Kumar, who leads our CIP Security Working Group. Here's what we we'll cover today. We'll start with a brief introduction to CIP, then we will explore how CIP enhances cyber resilience. We'll also take a look at the CIP Security Working Group and its alignment with IEC 62443 standards. By the end of these sessions, I hope you have a clear idea of how CIP can help to improving cyber resilience. So CIP is supported by industrial leaders. Our platinum members include Renaissance, Siemens, and Toshiba. We also have several silver members. Each member brings their own expertise to our collaborative efforts. This diverse membership helps CIP meet real world needs. So before we get into the detail, I'd like to highlight an exciting upcoming event. We are hosting a CIP mini summit on Thursday, September 19th from 1.30 p.m. to 5 p.m. at Australia Center Vienna. This is an in-person event co-located at the Open Source Summit Europe. This is a great chance to learn more about CIP and meet others who are interested in robust and secure software for our everyday lives. Whether you are already involved with CIP or just curious about what we do, this summit is the perfect place to gain insights, share ideas, and explore potential collaborations. You can register for the event right now using the QR code here, or just search for CIP Mini Summit 2024 online. We are really looking forward to seeing you there in person. All right, uh, let's dive into what CIP is all about. Look around you, Linux is everywhere. Just think about the trains you would like to work, the power plants supplying your electricity to your PC, or and so on. So these kind of hidden industrial IoT systems are the backbone of our modern world, and they already run on Linux. It's crucial to understand this because the security of these systems directly affects our daily life. Here's the issue. Cyber attacks on these systems are growing fast. Since around 2018, incidents in OT systems have nearly doubled each year. This is not just a number. It means we are threat to our power grids, transportation, and the other critical infrastructure systems. We are difficult to expect when these kind of attacks will happen. So this is why CIP and CIP resilience is more important than ever. Governments are already taking actions. We are seeing new activities like EU Cyber Resilience Act and the US Executive Order on improving cybersecurity. These activities pushing industries to prioritize cyber resilience. We still may have a time to align such kind of activities, but it's clear this is no longer optional. It's becoming a mandatory thing. So cyber, cyber resilience isn't just about preventing attacks. It's about creating systems that can anticipate threats, withstand attacks, recover quickly, and adapt. So let's think of it as a cycle. Prepare, protect, detect, respond, and recover. This holistic approach is key to maintaining strong, secure systems in the face of future threats. This is where CIP comes in. Our mission is to establish an open source base layer of industrial grade software for civil infrastructure systems. We are bridging the foundation for secure, reliable, 
and long-lasting infrastructure. Achieving this goal is not easy. We need to apply IoT concept to industrial systems while ensuring they meet strict requirements. We have to guarantee quality and longevity for products that have decades-long life cycle. Keeping millions of connected systems secure, ensuring backward compatibility, and meeting various standards for reliability, safety, and real-time capabilities. It's a complex balancing act. So our solution is the open source base layer, or just called OSBL. This is the foundation on which companies can build their specific applications. We provide CIP core packages and a long-term supported kernel. By offering this open source base layer, OSBL, we enable developers and companies to create more resilient systems without having to reinvent the wheel. Using CIP OSBL in your company can reduce effort up to 70% in areas like software maintenance, vulnerability monitoring, and application adaptations. So CIP scope is comprehensive. It covers everything from the software stack to tools and concept for product development and maintenance. We are currently focusing on six key activities colored right here. These activities include providing a super long-term supported kernel with real-time support, offering reference implementation as CIP core, testing CIP software stacks, aligning with cybersecurity standards, and providing safe and secure update mechanism. Now, uh, let's dive into how CIP specifically enhances cyber resilience. First, our long-term support model is a key element. We plan to provide a 10 plus year maintenance period for our kernels and core packages. This means systems built on CIP can remain secure and up-to-date well into the future, which is crucial for infrastructure with long life cycle. We are committed to using open source and upstream first principles. This approach leverages the collective expertise of global open source community, leading to faster identification of vulnerabilities and more robust solutions. Our standardization efforts are another key factor. By providing a common software platform as OSBL, we reduce compatibility issues and simplify integration. This is supported by CIP testing. So let's look at some more ways how CIP enhances cyber resilience. So we integrate comprehensive security measures aligned with IEC 62443 standards. This is not just about the checklist, it's about embedding security throughout the entire system lifecycle. Another critical aspect for our work is continuous monitoring and adaptation. Uh, we provide CB monitoring for the CIP kernel and CIP core. And we are incorporate secure software update mechanisms. So by combining all these elements, long-term support, community-driven improvements, standardization, comprehensive security integration, continuous monitoring, and secure updates. CIP provides a solid foundation for building and maintaining cyber resilience infrastructure systems. For more details and an update on where we are now, I hand it over to Dinesh. Dinesh, Amit. Thank you, Yoshi san. Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. So <clears throat> I will provide uh, further details 
how CIP can help to achieve a uh, end product uh, for cyber resiliency as well as uh, updates on security work group activities and uh, uh, recently uh, we have been uh, engaged with IEC 62043 assessment activities and uh, we would like to share the updates uh, about that. Yeah, so uh, as Yoshi-san explained in the beginning uh, of this session, uh, so there are basically five building blocks of any cyber resilient system. And these are identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. So uh, it's important that uh, we have to uh, understand uh, different ways, like how CIP helps to uh, basically achieve uh, these uh, uh, different uh, features in CIP images by incorporating, by investigating, and uh, by providing uh, several security features. So we will look into uh, that detail and we will try to uh, basically uh, map these uh, uh, building blocks of cyber resilient systems to the features provided by uh, CIP. So uh, first of all, uh, in uh, IC 62443 uh, 4-1, there are certain secure development processes. So any system which is not developed uh, by following secure development practices cannot be uh, secure and it can never become cyber resilient. So these are the basically basic foundations which includes secure implementation, secure by design, management of security related issues, security management and security update management. So if we go into the details of these practices, so each practice basically further elaborates upon detail. So for example, secure implementation. So secure implementation talks about detail of having a secure development process and then uh, following the, uh, following the uh, uh, let's say secure coding guidelines or providing a file integrity. So those kind of features should be considered during implementation. And similarly, uh, like secure by design. So any systems, uh, when they are being designed, there should be a risk assessment, there should be a consideration for uh, incorporating a secure design principles. And similarly, uh, when it comes to managing security related issues, so there is uh, basically a growing threat uh, where we can see uh, several security related issues are uh, reported and especially in open source uh, components. So by doing the investigation of uh, open source practices and by looking at upstream practices and CIP uh, internal processes which are uh, followed in CIP, basically we work with the uh, IEC uh, 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 assessment body and we have basically identified uh, these uh, process areas. So we will look into uh, more details. So these are the basically again uh, uh, foundations for attaining a cyber resiliency for any system. So uh, for example, identity and protect. So first of all, identifying uh, any users which are connecting to any system any software process, any devices, when they try to connect to any systems. So the basic requirement is to identify the user, the service or the process. And based on the uh, result of identification and authentication, accordingly, uh, the access should be provided. So in CIP, uh, by adding these capabilities like identification, as well as uh, providing the feature of supporting multi-factor authentication, and uh, adding the security packages, which include OpenSSL and many other packages. So these features basically helps to achieve, identify and uh, protect uh, requirements of a uh, cyber resilient system. Similarly, uh, the next building blocks, which are also very important, detect, respond and recover. So these are, uh, basic principle for any cyber resilient system. 
where in case of any cyber attacks, the system should be capable to uh, first of all detect and then by responding quickly recovering to the original state as well as without uh, losing any essential functionality. So one of the basic requirement of, of IEC standard is always maintaining uh, essential function or basic function of any system even in case of uh, a certain kind of cyber attack. So these features which have been uh, added uh, in CIP. So uh, like uh, we conducted a thorough threat modeling for the processes which are followed in CIP by doing by creating multiple uh, data flow diagrams. So for example, how uh, CIP developers interact with upstream uh, repositories, how uh, CIP developers basically ensure uh, they use uh, GitLab provided authentication and authorization mechanism. So by doing a uh, threat modeling and uh, understanding by understanding the attack surfaces, we have uh, included the uh, security features in CIP, which are basically helping to achieve uh, these features. Uh, so for example, development environment security, file integrity. So these are the, uh, these are the uh, common attack surfaces where uh, uh, like uh, any malicious actor can easily attack the surface, can make the changes in the system. So in CIP, uh, we have very clearly defined the roles where anyone cannot uh, simply make any change in the rest page or in any kind of configuration or source code which is uh, maintained by CIP. So uh, there is a detailed uh, documentation available as part of CIP IEC uh, documentation where we can see uh, the current maintainers and current developers who are eligible for doing that. And that is basically again helping us to uh, deter, to protect uh, from any kind of uh, accessibility issues. Then CV is scanning and providing reg regular fixes. It has been uh, followed uh, regularly by kernel work group members where uh, almost weekly uh, the detail of CV is uh, shared uh, with CIP users. Uh, through a, a, a channel called a CIP dev mailing list. And then uh, for doing a continuous monitoring and uh, audit logs, uh, we have been using uh, system day generally features as one of the main service, which can help anyone to audit what, what is going on in the system. If any user has taken any action or made any changes in system configuration, so these services can easily help to monitor and audit those actions. However, for uh, control system backup and restore, uh, we have, as of now, we have not added any additional capabilities or services because uh, we did not have any uh, good use case. However, we are definitely open to consider such use cases in future and we basically do uh, open round of discussion and surveys among CAP users to understand their requirements. And based on that, we are definitely consider adding additional features, services, and capabilities. So uh, during our uh, IC assessment, uh, speci specifically 4-1, which is uh, recently uh, we have completed, and we found like, uh, quite a good number of secure development practices, which is more than 90% in CIP with the help of definitely upstream processes as well as a CIP uh, process. We can follow the secure development processes specified by a 4-1 uh, standard. However, there are certain practices which are very, very specific to uh, end use cases or a product specific use cases for example, uh, custom development components from third party. So these are not sort of applicable in CIP as we did not have these huge cases or we did not directly address any specific huge cases because it's a platform and we try to be more generic. And similarly, uh, like uh, secure design best practices, which are very specific to uh, huge cases again, 
and let's say secure disposal guidelines so these are the some of the uh, basically 4-1 requirements which are currently not applicable in CIP however uh, we are we are basically again uh, working uh, with uh, certification body and trying to identify what additional information and guidelines can be provided to CIP users which will help them to address these processes and requirements for their end user uh, end use cases and uh, uh, we can see the certification document which is uh, received recently and this is one of the uh, good news basically for CIP communities uh, to adopt uh, basically the process followed in CIP and utilize the best practices and secure development processes in CIP. And then uh, during the assessment, we also worked to understand what is the current uh, basically coverage of the test. So when we create a security image from uh, current uh, uh currently installed packages so we have around 140 packages being installed in security image and we can see there is a very good uh, coverage where most of the packages have some kind of test either they are in uh, individual uh, package upstream or there are some tests available in debian ci so we can see more than 85 percent uh, packages have this kind of test However, there are very few uh, packages which don't have any test in upstream or Debian CI, which is about 7%. But again, this is with respect to the packages installed in CIP image. So uh, considering this, now again, we are working with uh, respect to upstream maintainers to understand the roadmap and how CIP community can help to add additional tests as well as bring most of the upstream test cases and the testing capabilities to Debian CI. So the test results will be available as well as the system. Basically, it will be helpful to keep uh, the system up to date at any point of time. So this is uh, also one of the important uh, feature for cyber resilient systems to keep the system up to date at any point of time. So uh, the next step in our uh, IEC assessment is to work for 4-2 assessment. And 4-2 basically is the standard which uh, has the requirements to add security capabilities in uh, CAP platform. So we have already identified certain packages and certain services which have been added as part of IEC layer in uh, CIP and we are uh, further working with the uh, uh, IEC uh, certification body to identify the gaps. And as part of FODES2 assessment, the next step we are going to do is SVV testing. And this SVV testing is quite comprehensive, which covers like functional testing, uh, security testing, uh, pen testing, vulnerability testing. So some of this uh, testing will be uh, carried out by uh, certification body, uh, which is uh, basically again uh, will be done by some third party. However, uh, we are eager to see the detail of that testing and we will try to incorporate those uh, testing practices as well as tools and services in CIP. So in future, our testing becomes even more strong as well as definitely we will work with upstream maintainers so that these testing practice practices can be again upstream as uh, Yoshisan already highlighted, our basic principle is upstream first. So we would like to see this testing happening in upstream and further coming down to downstream, helping and achieving the uh, entire community uh, these features. And uh, uh, soon we will uh, start working on 4S2 assessment and we will see what kind of additional features, capabilities we are going to add and we will definitely continue to share those updates. So uh, during the assessment of, uh, sorry. Uh, during the assessment, we also identified uh, basically there are certain challenges 
where is still open source community need to work further and uh, basically strengthen these areas. So for example, even though there is a lot of communication of security issues, a lot of discussion over mailing list, but when it comes to track specific security issues, it is quite hard to track what is the life cycle of that security issue because uh, there are no uh, sophisticated tools being used currently. So this is something uh, should be considered in future so that it becomes much more sophisticated, easy to track, easy to meet this kind of compliance requirements. However, uh, all the data is definitely kept intact and archived, whatever discussion is uh, done in mailing list. So we have the data, definitely uh, we, can, uh, we can track those uh, any security issues. However, it, it will definitely be much more easier if community works together to identify more sophisticated tools, much better ways to improvise this further. And then uh, similarly, we also identified uh, there is no common place or common security coding guidelines, which are followed across by all the developers. So we have to also accept the fact that uh, different developers come from different background and they have different practices or maybe there are different regions. So there should be some way where uh, community, uh, community works together to uh, document, streamline, and uh, basically all the developers start following these guidelines. So that will again strengthen the overall security posture. And then uh, the no, uh, basically no central place again to track security gen principle because again there are several types of components, different uh, developers working together. So these are some of the some of the practices which should be further improved, should be highlighted, and we should uh, continue to discuss this with uh, uh, other open source communities, members, and understand what kind of challenges are there, and we should work together to address them. At the same time, in CIP also, uh, we want to uh, discuss them further and try to uh, try to understand how at least from CIP side, what can be contributed, how they can be addressed at maximum. And uh, at the same time, we have to work together with uh, our community. So uh, next, basically, uh, software update is one of the important pillar for any cyber resilient system because uh, as multiple times already highlighted, recovering and uh, getting the continuous updates are important uh, components. So in CIP, basically we provide a comprehensive solution uh, for applying software updates. So through software update agent, uh, any uh, CIP users or any other users can utilize this feature. So uh, as we can see, like uh, if we have to do vulnerability management, we have to provide regular software updates, which are very crucial for patching the system for any vulnerabilities and always keeping the system up to date. And they also help for rapid response to threats. So basically supporting software update is important, which, is, uh, which will help to address vulnerability management rapid response to threats, incident recovery, adaptability, and rollback capabilities. So in CIP, there is a, a dedicated uh, work group, which basically works for uh, adding the capabilities related to software update. And in the next open source summit, we are going to have a, a demo, which is very specific to software update capabilities. And we are working with other communities like TUF and WFX, and uh, we are incorporating uh, those capabilities in CIP. So in the next open source summit event, which is uh, in Austria, Vienna, uh, we are going to demo these capabilities. So as already requested, uh, please uh, have a look on that. So 
for supporting software update uh, in addition to uh, basic software update which includes uh, uh, updating software systems by complete software update or let's say delta software update we have uh, already the solution uh, in cip now we are working further to enhance the security capabilities so two fish one of the framework which basically helps us to add additional security capabilities in software update uh, framework which includes like uh, key rotation and uh, uh, basically hardening the update delivery system by adding uh, basically additional uh, security layer and similarly uh, wfx helps us to achieve additional features like reporting the status of software update uh, pass or failure to the servers and then accordingly taking the uh, action so uh, this integration currently uh, this work is in progress and uh, for demo uh, basically we are going to demonstrate how these features work and what are the additional security capabilities will be added by this integration and uh, further we want to uh, basically work with tuf and wfx community to understand uh, and uh, understand what kind of challenges or future roadmap they have and bring new security capabilities in software update systems through this and again bringing those uh, features in cip would be in the roadmap definitely okay so uh, as part of uh, again 4s2 uh, sorry 4s1 assessment uh, we have created multiple documents uh, which describes in detail and try to address the requirements uh, of 4s1 uh, which includes secure de uh, secure development process related requirement file integrity development uh, environment security threat modeling so uh, similarly vulnerability management so all these kind of detailed documentation have been already added and we are working further to improvise this and uh, during the 4s1 assessment we have reviewed uh, these documents thoroughly and we have further worked and we have added several features like uh, uh, security hardening which will help uh, cip users and uh, other users to strengthen the security of the system and uh, apply uh, based on the requirements identify and uh, apply specific security best practices security tools so uh, this uh, documents these documents are available in icip ic uh, documents repository and anyone can have a look and provide feedback so we are open to accept any suggestions any comments through mailing list or directly through mrs in in the gitlab repositories uh, so current documents basically we have created uh, in markdown format and uh, we are further working to improvise them and we want to host them in read the docs format and uh, we have added the capabilities to generate pdf and once uh, this ic certification activities are completed we are going to generate uh, a pdf and further work to enhance them so this will be again continued effort to enhance the documentation as well as contribute back this to uh, office team communities so uh, for a cv handling uh, basically the target is to provide uh, cv updates and uh, the tools Uh, from CIP side, so CIP kernel team already provides the details of CV updates, and there are already existing tools available. However, uh, recently there have been a big number of CVs being reported, and uh, uh, managing CVs becomes quite difficult uh, with limited resources, and the number is uh, like uh, exponentially growing. so considering that cip kernel uh, work group members are working hard to uh, automate the process of filtering the cvs identifying the relevant cvs 
and providing CAP users relevant uh, CVEs updates as quick as possible, and uh, at the same time making sure the system is remains stable. And for that, we continuously run the required test like LTP test and some other uh, test. And those test results are again upstream to uh, kernel CI. And uh, the test results also available in CIP Lava Lab. And this test again executed on multiple uh, CIP reference hardwares. At the same time, for uh, CIP core packages, there are uh, tools uh, which are uh, available as part of uh, basically uh, CIP core uh, repositories. So these tools can be uh, used by CIP users and they can generate a CV list and based on the requirements, the applic applicability, they can update uh, their individual packages. And since in CIP core, we just uh, reuse the binary packages and we don't make any kind of modifications. So we directly recommend CIP users to utilize CIP core uh, tools provided uh, in, the, uh, in the repository and identify the right CVs and keep your system up to date. So again, this is uh, one of the important factor uh, for any uh, cyber resilient system and uh, security has been always a critical part of it. So uh, at the same time, uh, we, as part of CIP, we reuse open source components and we uh, try not to make uh, any changes. And uh, for that, basically what uh, we recommend is uh, as part of CIP IC layer, we have uh, created certain security configuration and which is available as part of uh, GitLab repository. So the current security configurations are default security policies and they are mostly based on the ISC secure uh, 311 document, which basically, which has provided certain test cases to test uh, IC 62444-2 security requirements. So our security configurations is currently based on the uh, test case requirement from ISC secure. However, these uh, security configurations can be easily customized to meet specific product security requirements and to meet, let's say, any specific uh, security compliance. So uh, this can be further customized. And of course, we are working further to add additional security capabilities and tooling as well as security configurations. And uh, when we uh, work for 4-2 assessment, this is going to be further enhanced based on the uh, SVB testing results and the issues identified uh, by uh, IC uh, body, and then those uh, uh, fixes we are going to incorporate in the security configuration, as well as by adding additional uh, security packages. So yeah, upstream first uh, policy have been one of the uh, key factor for us, which is uh, helping us uh, to, you know, uh, kind of reduce uh, or keep the minimum testing and uh, uh, giving more confidence to CIP users. And uh, primarily Debian packages are used for meeting uh, IC requirements. Uh, however, uh, CIP users are definitely, again, they can customize, they can use third party components and uh, uh, they can meet additional uh, product, product specific security requirements. So uh, one of the goal of uh, CIP IC assessment was uh, and is basically how to provide uh, maximum benefit, maximum you know reduction in effort if CIP users want to go for the uh, IC compliance. So uh, first of all, for 4-1 uh, documentation, which is provided by uh, CIP, so this documentation are definitely reusable and they can be further customized. They are available for anyone to reuse. So uh, this effort will definitely uh, reduce huge amount of uh, effort for creating product specific uh, documentation. And uh, we are uh, planning to further uh, 
uh, enhance the documentation so it will be even more easier uh, for CIP users to utilize existing CIP documents and just use, uh, just basically add product specific or requirement specific uh, uh, details or the processes and that way try to uh, utilize maximum uh, documentation from a uh, CIP IC documentation itself as well as in case uh, we we also recommend basically CIP users to uh, provide the uh, provide the suggestions or request a CIP like uh, in case if they find okay something is missing or something is not uh, addressed properly so we remain open to discuss that and basically we keep discussing that in our regular meetings where we have uh, some bi-weekly meetings or uh, some weekly meetings for different work groups as well as our TSC meetings where we uh, discuss with the CIP member as well as CIP users and try to do survey and multiple uh, collect multiple feedbacks so that we can uh, we can incorporate those uh, feedbacks or uh, those features in CIP and further downstream effort can be reduced. And uh, then uh, further when we uh, complete uh, for us to assessment as part of this, we are going to have a rich uh, test suite as well as IEC layer testing, which will basically help uh, to uh, do a lot of testing even for uh, end users. And uh, then further uh, basically using those capabilities for specific use cases. So this is going to be uh, beneficial for CIP users. And we we basically we will uh, keep it uh, up to date and uh, we will try to maintain it in a way that it remains compliant to FODES1 and FODES2 both. And that we have been discussing with the certification body what are the important uh, factors which we have to keep in mind and that we are again discussing within CIP community as well so that this compliance remains uh, intact and we uh, maintain it. And uh, if we do a comparison of the uh, different uh, distributions available and we can so we can easily see that there are uh, multiple uh, benefits uh, in favor of CIP where we have dedicated uh, kernel maintainers and uh, kernel workgroup members meet actively uh, weekly and they discuss open issues, open CVs and uh, try to address them and share the updates with CIP users. And uh, a promise for 10 plus years, security updates is one of the biggest advantages, as well as uh, compliance to IEC is adding another advantage, which is not available in other uh, freely available uh, distributions. And close monitoring of CVs is again uh, additional feature and uh, uh, we are working to enhance this feature again and uh, provide more tools, more capabilities, which can help uh, CIP users to uh, build up these capabilities and enhance security postures. And uh, we also uh, basically have extended support from Debian ELTS uh, packages, which are uh, again provided uh, based on CIP members requirements and this remains flexible. Uh, so this is also again uh, advantage and special benefit for CIP members. So being a CIP member, uh, basically, yeah, this is additional uh, benefit as well as uh, CIP specific uh, uh, advantage. And uh, regular automated testing as well as st strong support from uh, big players, which is again a growing and vibrant community. We are regularly doing uh, follow-ups and uh, uh, basically meeting members who are interested and interacting in different open source summits and events so that we can uh, incorporate uh, features and we can uh, work with other open source communities. So I would okay. like to request Yoshi San to please uh, take over now. All right, thank you, Dinesh. And as we wrap up, uh, let's quickly recap how CIP enhances cyber resilience. So we provide an IC6443-4 compliant platform with long-term support, 
constantly update it with the latest security features and fixes. By engaging with a multiple open source project, we tap into global expertise, which benefit both CIP users and the wider community. So remember, collaboration is the key to ensuring cyber resilience. And we'd love to invite industry peers from various sectors to join CIP. Your expertise can play a big role in shaping the future of cyber resilient infrastructure. And just a quick reminder, don't miss out our upcoming CIP mini summit on Thursday, September 19th, from 1.30 p.m. to 5 p.m. at the Australia Center at Vienna. It's a fantastic chance to learn about CIP's latest developments and connect with other CIP members. Make sure to register now to secure your spot. And to stay in the loop, join our mailing list at CIP Dev at markandlistcipproject.org. Follow us on X CIP Project and check out our website at cipproject.org. For access to our source code and documents, check out GitLab at gitlab.com slash CIP project. So we covered a lot today and now it's your turn. Any questions? Oh, we have now five questions here. So I would like to read the first one. Um, the Linux kernel recently become a CNA, CBA numbering authority to handle assigning of CBA within the kernel, but the CIP SLTS kernel is outside the scope of the CNA. How are security issues handled by CIP project and how are CBAs assigned? So, um, yeah, um, just answer from my side and then uh, I move to Dinesh. And yeah, first my answer is uh, we currently are tracking all CVEs for uh, upstream kernels because we have an upstream first policy. So which means uh, all uh, patched inside the CIP kernel is already upstreamed. So we uh, currently have uh, yeah, four SLTS kernels, uh, one for 4 4, 4 19 and uh, 5.10 and uh, 6.1. So all uh, SLTS kernels are tracking from the uh, upstream kernel community. So Dines, do you have any uh, comments on that? Oh uh, yeah, thanks Yoshi-san. So yeah, I also have uh, uh, limited information, I would say. Uh, I am not aware about the comment uh, which says CIP SLTS kernel is outside the scope of the CNA. So, uh, yeah, we would like to definitely uh, discuss this uh, further with uh, kernel work group members. However, as far as uh, I understand uh, in CIP, uh, basically CIP work group members, uh, based on the uh, kernel configs as well as uh, the support uh, from uh, requested from CAP members, the filtering of CV is done, and those CV uh, fixes are included and provided. Yeah, so that is the information we have. As well as uh, recently, we are working uh, for uh, uh, basically developing a tool which will automate this process, and there will be certain uh, basically criteria to filter the CVs. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. Um, let's move to next questions. Um, next question is, are there any plans to work with LF Energy to develop use cases for NERC environments? So that's a good question. Uh, we had a uh, uh, discussion with LF Energy several times and uh, uh, yeah, discussing uh, about the, how we can collaborate with LF Energy. And currently, uh, we have uh, some ideas. For example, we provide the foundation as a base layer. So LF Energy uh, uh, yeah, try to create a whole uh, software stacks 
And uh, we offer to use CIP software stacks uh, just underneath at the uh, LF Energy software stack. So this is our uh, offer. And also, uh, this is our uh, proposal to that. But um, unfortunately, not uh, yeah, starting this kind of work yet. So uh, any other comment to this? Uh, no, Yoshian, thank you. All right. OK, um, so move, let's move to the next one. Uh, next question is, uh, could you please elaborate if there are hardware side requirements for IEC 6443-4, 1 and 2, or uh, is it purely about software lifecycle management and getting the certifying process around it? Can any embedded platform running CIP stack get such certification reusing the work CIP security working group has done? I think that's a question at Fort Dinesh. <laughs> yeah, sure. So, uh, yes, there are uh, definitely certain requirements uh, which uh, require basically hardware capabilities. Uh, so, for example, secure storage is one of the hardware capabilities which is required to keep uh, specifically keys uh, and uh, security uh, related credentials secure. So that is hardware side requirement as well as some other hardware requirements uh, are there. So it is not uh, purely a uh, software uh, certification. <clears throat> However, uh, the software development uh, processes, uh, they they do not like directly uh, require immediately hardware support. But yeah, FODES2 requires uh, uh, hardware uh, support. And uh, coming to the Second part, which is can any embedded platform running CAP stack get such certification? So uh, I would say it's not uh, like uh, just by using the CAP uh, stack will will we uh, will make the product uh, CIC compliant. There are there will be certain product specific requirements and use cases which will not be addressed by a CIP uh, compliance. So those specific requirements have to be addressed by uh, end user, by CIP product. However, uh, the work which is already done by uh, CIP security work group and security other uh, CIP work group members, so that will help to drastically reduce the effort required to achieve the compliance for a CIP based uh, products. Yeah, so that would be uh, my response for this question. Thank you very much. Yeah, and uh, let's move to the next uh, questions. And uh, next questions are, we mentioned the secure coding style guidelines and secure design guidelines. Uh, there are documents for us, the public. If yes, where can one access them? So Dinesh? Yeah, yes. So uh, definitely there are, uh... Uh, basically, we also uh, like uh, identified, we try to search in upstream to find out the secure coding guidelines. So we found there are certain sources and we have already uh, documented those references and practices. They are available part of CAPIC uh, documentation repository. So uh, uh, the references are already included in the presentation. So please follow that and you can uh, definitely find them. But as I mentioned, uh, they are not, uh, you know, very elaborative, very comprehensive. So that is something uh, as uh, part of community, we have to work further to uh, improvise them. So the next question, which is, are there current customers of the CIP platform? So maybe uh, Yoshishan, can you please uh, answer this? Um, yeah, I think I already be difficult to, uh, maybe, uh, yeah, current customers means if you are a customer means users, uh, we are users and also, uh, this is open source project and we are not sure how, who is using actually a CIP, uh, base layer, but sometimes, uh, I find someone from the, uh, yeah, a community and also someone from some company 
and let them know uh, when uh, we are uh, opening our demo booth at the open source, commit, open source summit, and someone says we are using CIP for this kind of product. Oh, uh, this is a good uh, for us, and they're good to know for us too. So if you are already uh, using CIP, basically, yeah, uh, yeah, we are very welcome to know. Thank you very much. All right, and uh, next. Um, so, oh, one other point of information. Uh, I was confused that CIP was related to NERC CIP. Oh, I see. National Energy Resiliency Corporation Critical Infrastructure Protections. Yeah, you are using an anonymous that yeah, that is closely related. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> and when we started uh, the CIP project, uh, we are not sure what CIP did to uh, because we had defined the CIP as civil infrastructure platform. And after uh, yeah, some years later, uh, we also find the next CIP. So yeah, that makes confusion uh, for some users. Yeah, actually, uh, we also know that. Thank you very much for your comment. And... Uh, uh, next question is, uh, yeah, no CVEs will be assigned for any issues found in a version of the kernel that is not currently being actively supported by the stable kernel team. A list of the currently supported kernel branches can be found at uh, releases. CIP SLT scan is not listed on, yeah, uh, this releases. So my question is, uh, was uh, regarding issues introducing to CIP SLTS kernel, which were not present in the mainline kernel uh, due to a uh, different combination of patches, bugs uh, introduced uh, when backporting features, etc. I see. Yeah. Uh, you are correct. Uh, unfortunately, our SLTS kernel is not listed on the kernel.org. So, but um, yeah, our kernel is. Uh, part of uh, Git repository uh, included uh, git kernel.org. So we uh, uh, work with upstream kernel community. That is why uh, our repository is uh, on the, uh, not list release for this, but are listed on the Git, uh, Git repositories. But um, yeah, we know uh, this is uh, the reason why is uh, we uh, have uh, some limited uh, to support because uh, we are quite difficult to all features. So yeah, that is uh, also why, uh, yeah, not listed in kernel release. But uh, for example, we also collaborate with Greg Krohatman and Sasha Levin uh, to discuss about how, uh, yeah, for example, improve uh, long-term supported kernel. So such kind of discussion yeah, were made recently. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, last, uh, the, I'd like to uh, take a last question. Are there ways that the upstream county com community could make things easier for you? Oh. Mm, and that's also good questions. Yeah, yeah we would like to uh, work with the upstream county community. And uh, yeah, and sometimes we also would like to uh, make some contribution for automating uh, to detect our CBAs or to de detect bugs or something like that. So yeah, we direct to uh, work with the upstream kernel community. And Dinesh, do you have any comments for that? Uh, yeah, I think this is a, a basically very good suggestion and uh, uh, definitely uh, there are, I think multiple things uh, we should uh, look for uh, uh, so like as we identified uh, some of the things uh, uh, during our uh, 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 kernel bar group uh, activities so uh, i think uh, this should be this should be basically discussed maybe separately or in a different mm -hmm. channel so yeah uh, we can understand uh, uh, more details about this so yeah the next uh, good chance may be meeting in some open source summit or maybe sending uh, and sending emails to our CIP their mailing list. So this is something to discuss in more detail, I would say, rather.
Thank you for your comment and for your questions. And I think now it's uh, yeah, over time now. So uh, thank you so much for your attention. And now we directly close our presentations. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yoshi and Dinesh, for your time today. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Just a quick reminder that this recording will be on the Linux Foundation YouTube page later today. We hope you join us for future webinars. Have a wonderful day.